Warning, the profanity in this episode isn't fucking around. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Stamps.com, Adam and Eve, and by the new online service for people looking for all the mental health services with half the fat. I can't believe it's not better help. And now, The Scathing Atheist. This is Nikki, and as someone who has worked with people for over 20 years, I can assure you that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy, demanding, demeaning, soul-sucking, why the fuck can't you treat me like a person, you sentient piece of... <sighs> monkey men. And please, treat your customer-facing refs with kindness. We have filthy monkey feelings, too. It's October 14th. And it's Be Bold and Be Free Day. Okay. One out of two ain't bad. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Celebrate. I'm No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Jason Voorhees, New Jersey, <laughs> Cincinnati Red State and Red Town Blue State, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, the government gets a good look at Joel Osteen's pee-pee. The planets conspire to interrupt Facebook and no other major platforms. <laughs> and Anna Bosnick will be here to spear an earworm on a hook. But first, the diatribe. As atheists, we deal with two distinct types of religious arguments. The first broad category is arguments about the veracity of religion. Is it true? These are the apologetics, the arguments that say God is real or the Bible is true or and apologists increasingly retreat to this dodge, that science is somehow flawed, incomplete, or inaccurate, and therefore religion wins a point by default, or however the hell they think that works. And these arguments are basically silly. They're cognitive contortions, tricky wordplay, and logical fallacies. The second and far more potent type of argument is about the utility of religion. Is it useful? These are the ones you get from sideline atheists, the fence straddling agnostics, and of course, the spiritual but not religious types that are trying to justify their own inaction or demonize your activism. These are the arguments that take the form of, yes, yes, God almost certainly doesn't exist, but it helps people cope with death or it helps people rebuild their lives after a disaster. It helps build community, whatever. The condescending dismissal of atheism because the rubes need a God to cling to when they get scared of the dark. Now, we spend a lot more time on the latter than the former on this show because, let's face it, the other ones are just simpler. You know, either God exists or doesn't. Literally all available evidence points to him not existing. Plus, those arguments never change. Right? All the veracity arguments have been in basically their same form since the late Renaissance. But the utility arguments deal entirely with things that actually exist. They rely on data sets. They can be differently interpreted. They don't directly refute themselves. And most importantly... I feel like they have a lot more to do with society's willingness to tolerate religion's excesses than shit like Pascal's wager or the fact that there are still monkeys. So the one I want to focus on here is the idea that religion helps to give people's lives a meaning. This idea that religion justifies its existence by providing a narrative that can stave off depression or get people through the existential dread that might otherwise overwhelm them. I mean, let's face it, there, there, there's probably no other place religion can outdo atheism to a greater extent. Atheism offers you no more narrative than that which you can craft for yourself. Christianity, just to take one example of religion, has you allied with the creator of the universe, the redeemer of humanity, and all the forces of light against the author of all misery himself in a perpetual battle for the eternal souls of everyone on the planet. What's more, you personally play an integral part in that plan. God himself has laid out a specific role for you in the grand scheme of the universe. And to at least some degree, the entire plan hinges on your contribution. Now, very obviously, all that stuff is bullshit. You know, when we're called on to refute that narrative, it's like dunking on an unguarded trash can. But what we're talking about here is whether it's useful for people to have the belief should they want it. Does society benefit from people having the option to be full-time LARPers for Bronze Age Hebrew mythology? I, 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 well, I guess given the misogyny, homophobia, violence, and slavery justifications in their book, I guess that's a pretty obvious no. So let's set aside the specifics 
of the faith and ask if it helps society for people to have access to a narrative that, though untrue, provides them with meaning and direction. Now, the first problem many of you will have noticed with this argument and with this type of argument in general is that you have to start off by placing yourself on a bit of a pedestal. I mean, clearly you and I are able to make it through life without a fictional narrative undergirding our actions. So to even ask the question, you have to assume a mental or psychological inferiority in others. That being said, there are obviously differences on how well each of us copes with all the shit life throws at us, right? So like... Not everybody needs therapy, but there's no arrogance in admitting that some people might need it even if I don't, right? So as tempting as it might be to dismiss this argument as sheer vanity, it isn't a sound dismissal. If we really want to tackle this one, we have to look at the value of purpose. Is it a benefit to believe that your life has meaning? Well, ultimately, I actually find this argument as unconvincing as the one about religion helping people cope with death, and for the same reason, essentially. You know, despite all the arguments to the contrary, pretending death doesn't exist is not a fantastic coping strategy. It turns out that the healthiest psychological strategy in coping with death is confronting it, because as uncomfortable as that is, it's the only actual option and everything else is just a delaying tactic. The same is true with narrative. Sure, it's not appealing to hear that your life has no intrinsic purpose, but that's the fucking truth. And ultimately, life is almost certainly going to force you to confront that fact at some point. What's more, the throwaway apologetics about God having a plan get less and less effective as we get older. So whatever benefit a person might derive from it is certain to weaken over time. And then they're going to go looking for more, right? I mean, they I guess they have the option of getting a late start on coping with the inherent meaningless of life. But the other option is to double down and start looking for narrative elsewhere. And that, that, that search for ever more potent narrative can take several forms and all of them fucking suck. You know, sometimes it means getting more and more serious about whatever religion you started in. Sometimes it means trying out all the other different religions you can think of. And since the religion with the most potent narrative tends to be a cult, it leaves people primed for some pretty fucked up stuff on that journey. But there's also the non-religious directions to take as well. And we see that every time somebody tries to explain how the fucking deep state is hiding the truth about ivermectin or the Illuminati is sacrificing babies under a pizzeria. Conspiracy theories are, after all, just the search for narrative and overdrive. They're created by our tendency to find patterns and random occurrences, and they're perpetuated by our need to assign meaning to happenstance. Is so often the argument about religion providing purpose are presented as though purpose is an unmitigated good, but it's also a fucking lie. Lives don't actually have meaning. Narratives can only be assigned to them after the fact. And by perpetuating the childish notion that one's life not only can have meaning, but should have it, like that, that, that you are owed a meaning for your life, just hinders our ability to cope with that in a realistic way. But far worse, it leaves people vulnerable to cult leaders, conspiracy theories, and at its worst, authoritarianism. Look, it's no great revelation to say that people are better at dealing with problems when they first admit that those problems exist. But unfortunately for us in our culture, admitting that problems exist is pretty much the opposite of being religious. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Gihun and Saibak to my sang Wu Heath and Wright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to somehow complete this intro with no spoilers? Red light, red light. <laughs> Okay. Ah, shit. D does green light count as a spoiler? What if listeners haven't played the game? Damn oh, it. <laughs> all right, right. Okay. Well, quick, before we spill something important, we're going to take a break for a word from this week's first sponsor, Stamps.com. Hey, podcast listener. This week's episode is sponsored by Stamps.com, so we thought we'd give you a quick tour of the Scaling Atheist podcast factory so that you can see how all the sausage gets made. So this here is the sensory deprivation tank that we keep Heath in 23 hours a day so he can craft his puns perfectly undisturbed. Oh, okay. What about Tara Fawcett? But nope, I already used that one. Ah, uh, oh, damn it. And over here, Carl and Eli are hard at work in our continuity office, making sure the character and bit timelines stay secure at all times. No, Carl, Clip Clop Tom has expired by 2020. We have to use Faraway Cecil instead. Again? Yes, again. We will always use him again. And last but not least, our patron reward shipping center. But unlike all our other jobs, Stamps.com makes this one a breeze. Stamps.com brings the services of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS shipping right to your computer so Lucinda can upload addresses, print postage, and arrange pickup right from her desk. 
I sure can. Eli, just don't, man. Whether you're an office sending invoices, a side hustle, Etsy shop, or a full-blown warehouse shipping out orders, Stamps.com will make your life easier. Almost as easy as working in our HR department. Mm, Puzzle and a thunderstorm HR department? No, that sounds fine. You're allowed to do that. All you need is a computer and standard printer. No special supplies or equipment. Within minutes, you're up and running, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send it. And you'll get exclusive discounts on postage and shipping from USPS and UPS. Save time and money with Stamps.com. There's no risk. And with our promo code SCALING, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in SCALING. That's Stamps.com, promo code SCALING. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about Ouija board? Weed, Ouija, Ouija. Uh, maybe. Man? <laughs> and now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, they're literally trying to kill us, y'all. And, and while it might be technically inaccurate to say that religion is trying to kill us we're talking about a group of people that's virtually all religious and they're using religion to do it so it's almost a distinction without a difference at this point when it's death the correlation causation thing it's not important of a distinction. <laughs> right. exactly and by the way when i say us of course i don't mean atheists i mean humanity and since i could literally be talking about at least like a dozen different topics that we regularly discuss on the show to this point let me narrow things down a bit i was gonna say yeah, yeah. <laughs> this week's lead story is about them trying to kill us with covid using religious exemptions again specifically it's about a lady getting a quickie ordination and immediately passing out over 150 religious exemptions to mask mandates. Fuck your face. Fun. Up. It's like the murder version of getting ordained so you can do your buddy's wedding. Yep. She got ordained so she could do her friends and family's funerals, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yep. exactly. Okay, I think blue states and blue localities need to start leaning in all the way on this thing. If you want a religious exemption to the vaccine in like California or New York, I think you have to wear a plague mask with the giant beak, there you go. the, the bl all black leather, something like that. <laughs> if they think we're persecuting them anyway, we might as well get some enjoyment out right. of it and yeah, actually exactly. persecute them, right? Get, at least get to persecute. Yeah. So I, I just I hate to keep harping on the existential threat to our lives and prosperity. But this story is such a perfect exemplar of exactly the kind of shit we've been talking about that I had to arm you with it. The homicidally misguided idiot at the center of this story is Kristen Grant, an Ohio mom that noticed a loophole in the school district's mask mandate. Specifically, it said that if a student submitted paperwork signed by a religious official, they didn't have to wear a mask. Now, keep in mind that there's literally no religion in all the goddamn world that has a faith based reason not to wear a mask. Isn't that one of the commandments? No, nope. it not. <laughs> as it turns out, there's literally no known religion on earth that ever said anything about that at all prior to 2020. Yeah, if there was a religion that knew about germs, it would be called the right one. Yep, yeah. <laughs> and yet the school district felt compelled to add that line. So Kirsten Grant got herself ordained by the Universal Life Church, which is the religious equivalent of a diploma mill. Uh, like, seriously, they've ordained pets before. Four states specifically have rules saying their ordinations don't count for fucking weddings. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of the, like, nine churches in America the IRS is iffy about giving a tax-exempt status to. And yet, it was good enough for medical exemptions. Okay, okay, no joke. A few years ago, when I put out my All Churches Are Bad Challenge, TM, 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 someone offered this one as an example of a good church. So... One more notch in the bedpost, yep. everybody. We found it. Yeah. And they're literally the least churchy of any church, according to the U.S. government. Right. And they're still a giant problem. This is basically your closing argument QED part of your thesis there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So armed with those rock solid credentials, Grant proceeded to pass out signed exemptions to mask mandates to anybody who asked for one. And among the most terrifying details of this story, that was 169 fucking people. Tight, 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 tight. Yeah. Also competing for most terrifying detail in the, is the fact that the district went on to accept all 169 of those, even cool. though you've got to imagine that like literally every single person with a mask exemption was getting it from her. And apparently that wasn't the only school district she was signing exemptions for. OK, I want to put this carefully. I'm not saying it would be funny if she and her family got COVID and died. 
Mm. I am saying it would be fitting. It would be fitting. If okay. That I don't know. Let's let's think about the funny thing. Is okay. it not? Would that not be? Okay. Well, if she died from like a piano or anvil situation, that's definitely that's funny. very funny. That is funny. Maybe. Okay. All yeah. of it's funny. All right. Yeah. If she had COVID while dying from a piano situation, that would be both fitting. Oh, and funny. she beats COVID <laughs> and she walks out, and then the piano yeah, there falls. You for, there you go. Okay. There yeah. Is. That's actually okay. That's pretty funny. So when questioned about the ruse, about how she determined if they had a genuine religious objection to the mandate, Grant defended her murderous bullshit thusly, quote, it's not my job to prove or really ask, and it's not my business what their religion necessarily is. I'm a constitutional Christian. What? I think the Constitution is there for a reason. God created our bodies in a perfect way, end quote. That is in the Constitution. <laughs> See, well, so in other words, <laughs> my political whims supersede the public good because I'm Christian. And I look, I know political parties don't generally have slogans, but if the Republicans are looking for one. Yeah. <laughs> Alternate slogan. If we die, it's fitting and maybe funny. <laughs> <laughs> maybe funny. Yeah. The Republican Party. We are Robert Nozick's utility monster. The party. Non-ironically. Yeah. Seriously. That's what we are. Wow. And in Olstein can't you pee pee news. Okay. As businesses struggled to survive the first COVID lockdowns, as mom and pop shops across this nation closed their doors forever in the face of shutdown, Joel Osteen's Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, ample provider of absolutely fucking nothing, received $4.4 million in PPP loans to keep their busy staff of nothing doers employed. And this week, we learned that they're giving at least some of that money back, probably because they didn't keep all their nothing doers while they were shut down. Yeah, right. And, and by the way, before anybody says, well, I mean, they're employees like any other. I want to remind you that churches are exempt from EEOC regulations with the excuse that they're not like any other employer. So in this instance, they had their cake, ate it too, and then gave it back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just to be clear, their cake is legalized bigotry and stealing tax dollars for nothing. Yep. yep. And now they're giving back regurgitated tax dollars. <laughs> Still keeping the bigotry. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. So if you're wondering why is Osteen giving the money back? Well, we don't know. His church has less than 500 employees, so he's not obligated to repay the loan as long as he used it for staffing. And my guess is based on nothing but the shiny, shiny evil radiating from Osteen's teeth. That's not what happened. Right. right. This is a dude who lives in a $10 million mansion who publicly bragged to his congregation about buying a $300,000 Ferrari. I think he saw the money when all hungry, hungry hippos on it and repaying this loan is the church cleaning up his mess. Well, right, because like thanks to our fucked up legal system, those four point four million dollars were the only dollars he was accountable for in any fucking way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were already looting the public coffers so much already. The PPP loans is just a new version of wasting money on magical nothing. Quick reminder, we give religion about eighty five billion dollars a year as a tax subsidy for the magical nothing they do. Just in the U.S. That's yep. just in the U.S. But don't worry, everybody. That very probable reason for repayment hasn't stopped Lakewood Church from telling everyone who will listen that they're just giving the money back like it's some fantastic act of charity. Right. Yeah. No, it's like when you thwart a crime by thinking of a better thing to do that afternoon. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> so news of this return has been unskeptically and admiringly reported just about everywhere as though giving the money back now at their own pace, and I should point out, stopping whenever the fuck they want to, yeah. was the same as not raiding government coffers during one of the most fragile times for small business in the last 50 years. Either way, I guess it's good that Joel Osteen's church has less money. Sure. I mean, giving money to Lakewood is essentially throwing money down a hole if that hole was also somehow racist, sexist, and homophobic, <laughs> and it's it is 2021, so I'm going to take the win where I can. I'll take the win where I can. <laughs> and in Zuck Your Face news, Facebook mostly shut down for a few hours last week, preventing everyone from arguing about nothing and sharing dank memes, at which point millions of people flew into a murderous rage. <laughs> and we have two theories on the cause of that. Option one, Facebook's 
VP of infrastructure is right. And it was configuration changes on the backbone routers that coordinate network traffic between data centers, which led to an interruption in digital communication. Or option two, Mercury was in retrograde. (laughs) It's one of those two. (laughs) Hard to say. Speaking of correlation and just unrelated, all supporters of that second hypothesis keep dating guys with tattoo sleeves and they don't know why it doesn't work out. <laughs> so, sorry, listeners with tattoo sleeves. Okay, I, I want to be clear on this. I'm not sorry. You did that to you. So people who couldn't make it an afternoon without Facebook have issues and they need to do some inner reflection after that. But I don't want to diminish the very real problems this caused for people all over the world that rely on Messenger and WhatsApp as their primary source of communication, as well as people who were competing in very important weekly challenges on their inexplicably bricked Oculus Quest. Why the fuck would (laughs) Facebook have to be up for that to run? The struggle is real. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. So point is that IT nerd was probably lying. So let's examine (laughs) the cosmos. According to astronomy expert Lisa Stardust, <laughs> get the fuck out of here. <laughs> she's she's an astronomer for Teen Vogue or, or astrologer, but basically the same. Either way, <laughs> according to Ms. Stardust, Mercury retrograde occurs four times a year. During this time, miscommunication, technological meltdowns, travel issues, and faulty news are rampant. Except this. This is this is this is real news right here. Fuck. Okay, whatever. Continue. I'm continuing my quote. <laughs> Every time I talk about this, fake news <laughs> is rampant. So she continues. Six planets are currently retrograde in the sky at the moment. Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Not a planet. No. All of these planets are playing a role in the delay to fix social media. Jupiter connects people. Saturn takes on the task of fixing matters. Uranus is ruler of the internet and innovation, which is damn impressive because there are a lot of anuses on the internet. So the yeah. fact that mine <laughs> is the ruler, that's... Neptune is the planet of confusion and illusion. Collusion. And Pluto represents turmoil and therefore annoyances. With these five planets in retrograde motion and Mercury added to the mix... It's safe to assume that it'll be a hot minute before any of these technological issues are reconciled. After today, it'll be hard to tell an astrologer that astrology or retrogrades are not real, especially since you'll have to tell them offline. Oh, you'll have to use your face. Okay. Yeah. My favorite thing about that is that she's like, Jupiter is in charge of peanut butter and Pluto is split ends. <laughs> <laughs> also, Mercury is in the mix. She couldn't make up one more set right? of planet power. I a just, bullshit. I okay. I love that Uranus is in charge of the internet. Right? Listen, it's just been sitting there for, suffering through all the ass jokes for centuries, thinking you motherfuckers just wait. Tim Berners Lee is going to change everything. <laughs> <laughs> Be so important. So, listeners, maybe you're thinking Teen Vogue is not the best source for news about astronomy and network. Hardware stuff. I am, I am not thinking yeah, that. Fair enough. <laughs> Let's check with Cosmopolitan. Ms. <laughs> Stardust was backed up by Erica Smith of Cosmo's <laughs> Astronomy Desk, I guess. Okay, and she doesn't even have a space name. How can we trust her? <laughs> no, right? Dumb. Smith. Come on. What's a Smith? Nothing. Smith star. Nope. Smith. Erica Smith. She also added that Instagram has a Zodiac sign which added to all the chaos. Here's the quote from Erica Smith of Cosmo. Yes, Instagram is a Libra. In astrology, apps and buildings and countries and pretty much everything else you could think of have birth charts, just like people. Instagram launched on the App Store on October 6th, 2010, making that its birthday. Mm. And that means Instagram is being extra affected by this particular Mercury retrograde. And the same goes for all you human Libras out there. Sorry. End quote. Oh, you know, I'm a Libra. So that explains why nobody signed up for my OnlyFans. Mercury <laughs> is in tardigrade. So <laughs> I would correct you, but it's not more correct if you say it the other way. Uh, equal. And just in case anyone's not familiar with the term retrograde, as it applies to planets, it just means appearing to move backward. So most of the time, we see the planets moving from west to east through the stars. But the planets revolve around the sun at different speeds. So when a faster-moving planet catches up and passes a slower one, 
it appears to be moving the other way for a bit. Just to be clear, retrograde motion of a planet doesn't even actually happen. Nope. It just looks like something different is happening, but it's not. It's nothing. It's nothing happening. It's just like if I stand next to Eli and he starts walking, he seems to be moving forward in my eyes away from me. But then I start walking faster. And when I pass him, he seems to be moving backward relative to me while I pass. And my computer exploded. Okay. Okay. (laughs) That was weird. That was have Just pissed off your burst into flame. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like we need to find he's a Sagittarius computer. So while we do that, we're going to pause for a word from our other sponsor this week, Adam and Eve. Hey, podcast listener. I'm Eli Bosnick here with a very important public service announcement. You are probably not lubing up your genitals enough. Wait, I'm not. That's right, Heath. You're not. Due to general prudery and the myth that lubrication is only needed for fitting stuff up your butt, 81% of Americans say they don't use personal lubricants, and that is way too many. Is it? Sure is. Lube is great for when you're by yourself, with a partner, or just trying to fit something up your butt. Lube makes it easier and more pleasurable. There's self-warming lube, flavored lube, hypoallergenic lube, and so much more. Okay, but where can I get this lube you speak of? Why, adamandeve.com, of course. They're the number one adult toy superstore. And when you use our code SCATHING at checkout, you can get almost any one item 50% off, plus 10 tantalizing free gifts. Ooh, consider me tantalized. So stop dry rubbing your bits like you're trying to start a fire. Head over to adamandeve.com and drench your business with that slippery stuff today. And don't forget to use our offer code SCATHING. That's SCATHING. S-C-A-T-H-I-N-G. Offer code SCATHING at checkout at adamandeve.com. So, edible, you say? Yeah, but it's it's for mouth stuff. It's not just for eating. Mm, I'll be the judge of that. Okay. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in misogyny. It's almost like misogyny knew I had the month off, isn't it? Like, I get that I'm pretty small potatoes in the grand scheme of things, but it really kind of played out like they didn't want to get rid of Roe versus Wade while I was on the clock. So look, I'm not going to rehash all the fucked up shit that's been going on with Texas's on again, off again abortion law since the last time I was here. And I'm not going to take an I told you so victory lap around all the people who've emailed me over the years to say Roe wasn't in real danger. But I do want to underscore how under threat it really is. Look, the American public is still overwhelmingly on the side of abortion rights. Hell, even 43% of Republicans oppose overturning it. But despite that, the Christian zealots in government are getting awfully brazen about advocating for it. Where they used to couch their efforts in bullshit platitudes about safety standards and the sanctity of fetal tissue, they're now just admitting that the goal is to remove the rights from women. Take, for example, Mississippi's Attorney General Lynn Finch, who could barely contain her excitement when interviewed about it on an anti-abortion video. Now, Texas has overshadowed some of the other states at this point, but it's worth remembering that Mississippi, in many ways, kicked off this most recent series of challenges to Roe back in 2018 when they passed their 15-week abortion ban. At the time, it was the most restrictive abortion ban in the country, and it was pretty much immediately halted pending judicial review. Well, that review is about to reach the Supreme Court, where many expect Roe will sputter its last breath. And Finch just couldn't be happier about the threat to bodily autonomy, saying, quote, This will be the most significant game-changing case probably in my lifetime that affects overturning Roe versus Wade and sets us on a new course. I just think God has given us this opportunity to be here. The prayers, the uplifting, it's just been incredible for myself, for the team, end quote. And why is she so excited about removing people's rights? Well, according to the person who invoked an invisible space wizard in her preamble, Roe, quote, shackles states to a view of facts that are decades out of date, end quote. Because the last thing Mississippi Republicans want is antiquated thinking. But just so that I'm not overloading you with bad news, I want to leave you with the sad, sad tale of misogynistic Christian asshole Logan Dorn. Dorn earned a bit of unwanted fame last month when he confronted two women at a beach for wearing swimsuits that he deemed too revealing. They recorded this ridiculous asshole and posted the video to TikTok, where it quickly went viral and garnered him all the derision he so richly deserved. Well, like many an asshole before him, he took a feeble swing at apologizing and just made it worse. 
His non-apology doubles down on all the shit that was wrong with his presumptuous harassment in the first place. Plus, it adds a bit of transphobia with a throwaway line about how we're living in a time when people, quote, don't even know their gender, end quote. So normally the story ends there. But in the month or so since his first response video fell flat, he's been trying to figure out how it all went so wrong. And apparently what he came up with was that the first video didn't rhyme. So no shit. He posted another video this week where he raps his feelings about the issue. Now, the gist of the rap is that he's the victim of cancel culture because he did a thing and there was a consequence. But if you can make it far enough into the video to realize that, I commend your tolerance. Luckily, friend of the show, him at Meta, transcribed the damn thing or I'd have no clue what it said. Anyway, with that reminder that sometimes the asshole gets what's coming to him, I'll hand things over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines in Gun of a Sun news. Some of them are trying to kill us harder than others. Right? This is kind of <laughs> Look, I don't know if harder is the right word, but like with fewer steps, maybe. And that means it's time for us to once again talk about the Rod of Iron Ministries. <laughs> Gun of a Sun. Awesome. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> Because of all the religious groups that should terrify our American listeners, this one pretty much should be at the top of your list. Of course, we've talked about these militant lunatics and their AR-15 enriched worship services before. We talked about them a couple of months ago when they bought a million dollars worth of property in Texas to build a compound they could fight the deep state with. Well, we learned this week that one compound just isn't enough, and they've also purchased a 130-acre mountain property in Tennessee, which is intended to serve as a training center terrorism training center yeah say what you will about cassandra's situation but at least she didn't have a podcast right, right? She didn't yeah have to be- <laughs> oh you're prophetic you eli bosnick you're a, yes. a prophet thank you okay i'm just gonna check on your tesla prophecy from a while <laughs> let's see tesla stock it's at like 809 dollars you said sell Christ. at 300 i'm just everyone stay tuned you said big short you, it's gonna come you'll see you'll see time will tell keep death in the universe <laughs> Yep. Coming. <laughs> yeah, it'll be worthless at that point. So, okay. So quick reminder of the background here. Officially, the World Peace and Unification Sanctuary Church, Ron of Iron Ministries, was founded by Hyung Jin Moon when he was deemed too nutty to run the unification church started by his father's son, Myung Moon. They first came to national attention when they held an assault rifle blessing ceremony pretty much immediately after the Parkland shooting. And since then, they've grown increasingly militant and conspiratorial. Yeah, when God's on the mass shooting side of the mass shooting is where you start, you know we're in trouble. Yeah, they've descended from there. God. And you know these people are studying that Waco video constantly. And they're saying to themselves, okay, you know what the problem was? Nobody's doing dive rolls at yep. all. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody out to the paintball course in Tennessee, we could practice that. We'll, we'll look at this. So, okay. The main takeaway here is that Hyung Jin Moon, also known as Sean Moon because he's trying to gain acceptance in the far right, is about as quintessentially a Hollywood bad guy as you can possibly be. He is a self-proclaimed messiah that calls himself the second king. His brother owns a small arms manufacturer where his church holds spiritual events. The SPLC lists his church as an anti-LGBTQ cult. And when he addresses his followers, he often does so wearing a crown of polished bullets. Okay, that's not at all an exaggeration, Mm -hmm. literally a bullet crown. Just imagine a Muslim leader with a crown of fucking bullets buying a training compound in Tennessee, 130 acres, and he got killed by a drone. He's dead. You can't imagine him. Imaginary guy. They sent a real drone against the imaginary hypothetical guy that Heath just (laughs) sent. Yep. (laughs) So yeah, the race to be the craziest gun-toting, MAGA-loving, lunatic church of terrorism and deep state bullshit is apparently on, and there are multiple contestants, and we're still trying to find the national line where laws start applying to religious organizations and beliefs. Christian ones, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. Yeah, well, okay, so with a little luck, we can turn them against each other by telling Dave Dobenmeyer that their church is run by an Asian, but until then, we're going to have to just continue to exist under the constant threat of far-right Christian terrorism. Hmm. And inside, kicked in the balls news. Too often when someone is the victim of a scam or a huckster, by the time they know they've been had, the thief in question has vanished into the night with their money. Which is why it's fantastic to hear that this week, the ripped off rube of a California psychic is suing her and fucking everyone she's ever known for charging him 
$5,100 to remove a witch's curse. Yeah, right. Like, th this is less like selling somebody the Brooklyn Bridge and more like selling them the Brooklyn Bifrost. <laughs> you should get to sue them <laughs> twice or something. All right. You got to pay that $5,100 back. And also, Idris Elba gets to punch you in the face 5,100 times. That's the ruling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the rule. That's true. Okay, that I would pay for. Yeah, I'd, I'd pay to watch that. <laughs> Yes, when Moro Restrepo went to Sophia Adams, who runs the business Psychic Love Specialist by Sophia, and calls herself a PH.D life coach, she gave him a tarot reading that, surprise, surprise, revealed to him that he was cursed because his ex-girlfriend had hired a witch and that she could remove said curse for the low, low price of $5,100, which Restrepo made a $1,000 down payment on. A down payment? I love this as an installments. Right? <laughs> like, if he misses a payment, the repossession jokes write themselves. <laughs> now, it's not clear when <laughs> Mr. Excellent. Restrepo realized Miss Adams was not, in fact, removing a witch curse from his love life, but... As soon as he did, he sued her, her landlord, her daughter, and her husband okay. for $25,000, which includes compensatory as well as punitive damages. Cool, cool. Let's see this go up to the Supreme Court. Looking forward to Alito and Coney Barrett explaining that Restrepo did not prove the curse is still there. So, you know, that's <laughs> the founding fathers intended for that to yeah. be a proof. So. <laughs> sure did. Sure did. And look. I know it's easy to blame Restrepo for his gullibility or to look at his ask as a bad faith money grab, but scams are the fault of the con artists and tarot cards are a scam, okay? They are not an ancient spiritual practice. They are not the sacred practice of an oppressed people. They are the fuck paintings of a couple of white con men that are used primarily for this exact scam. Not for fortune fun, right? Nope, not for entertainment purposes, yeah. Right. The fact that me and my cousins might play the three shell game on the weekends doesn't make it less of a scam when it's used by con artists to hurt people. Because while you might know tarot cards are fake, there's a lot of people out there who don't. And those people are paying for their ignorance at around $5,000 a pop. Mm -hmm. And finally tonight. We have a story about self-proclaimed Christian prophetess Kat Kerr. And with the retirement of Pat Robertson, she's very important to the show <laughs> and to the atheist movement in general. We're running out of people. Yeah, she talks out loud all the time. So you know how Matt Powell trapped himself into being our indentured servant who makes videos of how stupid religion is? Mm. I do know that, yes. She's like that. But a volunteer. We didn't Ooh. trick her or anything. We don't, she just does this for fun. <laughs> She's also a crypt keeper who's very badly disguised as a pink troll doll. Yeah. Well, last week she announced the rules about aborted fetuses in heaven. In case you were wondering, if a mom gets to heaven, the mom can pick the, the age for their aborted fetus who's also in heaven. Really? <laughs> I'm really sympathetic to the aborted babies. Just like, okay, first you murder me and now I'm two for all eternity because you like my cheeky cheeks? You're the worst, Diane. The worst. Can I tell you that? <laughs> so I'm going to start with a few other important details about fetal tissue that we know about thanks to Kat Kerr. For example, a miscarried fetus ends up going back inside the mother's uterus. Does it? She said... Literal words, God will put it back. And with about 23 million known miscarriages in the world every year, that means God is putting them back about 44 times every minute that we know about. It, it, it actually takes up a bunch of God's time, just this one thing. <laughs> I, can't, I can't be the only one picturing this as like a, like a Lucy and Ethel at the Chocolate Factory type situation. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> He's just mumbling to himself, I knew I should have made him do it like seahorses. This is taking forever. <laughs> By the way, we also learned from Kat Kerr that right after Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed to the Supreme Court, all the aborted fetuses in heaven sang and celebrated. Also, she stole our idea for an adorable Broadway musical. I God she didn't say it. what song they were doing. <laughs> Here's the latest. Memory. According to Kat Kerr, quote, if you had an abortion and you repented, you will get to raise that baby. Normally, they stay as babies because the mother wants them as a baby. 
Possibly it's growing. It grows very slowly in heaven, or God just keeps it young. And that's for the purpose of the parents coming to heaven. End quote. See, I was going to make a joke about how much it would suck to spend eternity unable to wipe your own ass. But then I remembered who I podcast with, and I realized that everybody's heaven is a little different. Yeah, and it's not that I'm <laughs> unable, Noah. I'm unwilling. Right. No, unwilling. Yeah. Moving right along, Kat Kerr also <laughs> added, you won't have to do all-night feedings or diaper changes. They have beautiful nurseries all over heaven where your little babies are taken care of by angels. That's their assignment, what? the angels. Ah, yes. The only thing terrifying to a hundred-faced screaming ball of fire, a onesie poop explosion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so based on all that, uh, I have a few questions. Yep. You guys shout them out if you have any answers to these mm -hmm. questions. Yep. First of all, do you think some of the moms pick a super old fetus? Do you think they're in that? <laughs> 83. 83? Yeah, I don't know. Do some of them do like a Benjamin Button scenario? Or are you allowed to do that? Have it move different ways? And why does heaven, the magical realm of eternal paradise, have areas full of orphaned, aborted fetuses all over like it's the fucking <laughs> Texas border? That's insane. Bottom line, the design is very unintelligent according, yeah, right. based on everything mm -hmm. we heard. All right, well, you know, Pink hair is our fat and babbling about cartoony heaven minutia is our singing. So that's going to do it for the headlines tonight. Heath Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, Anna's going to remind us that in artistic terms, at least, the opposite of talented is Christian. After doing a few on this show, we eventually spun our cinematic reviews off into their own podcast. But as a quick reminder that all of the Christian forays into the arts are worthy of our mockery. It's time for another installment of God Awful Music. And Heath had to hop off early, so he's not going to be on this segment, but we will be joined by our resident musical expert, Anna Bosnick. Anna, welcome back. Oh, Noah, I have been waiting for this one. Yeah, I yeah, I, 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 I haven't been as excited as long, but I've been as excited. So <laughs> tell us, Anna, what will we be breaking down today? We will be breaking down Smell the Color Nine by Chris Rice. <laughs> yeah, you and Smell the Color Nine. Yes, you heard that correctly. And now this, <laughs> we gave you the choice, Anna, uh, on, on what, to, what to do. So why did you pick this one? Oh, so I have a playlist on my phone that's called God Awful Music that I'm constantly adding to because I have this grim fascination about it. And this was the song that inspired me to start said playlist. Oh, really? So I, yeah. <laughs> I was on a road trip with my buddy who was raised Pentecostal. And I mentioned doing the parody of God's Not Dead and Jesus Take the Wheel. And they were like, oh, hold my beer, you sweet summer child. And they played this song. <laughs> And it was stuck in my head for fucking months. It really was. It was. <laughs> I, I got back home from that trip and I was like, Eli, Christian music is whack. We really need to make fun of it more. <laughs> like, I have written two parodies of this song. Wow. Two. And, like, I have a hate, love, to hate, hate some more relationship with it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this music? Well... If you got a vague feeling that this cult might not be all it's cracked up to be, but damn it, you're next up for Kool-Aid. <laughs> you will love this song. It's it's daytime television does a ghost episode, the song. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Yes. Uh, yeah. And please don't fucking email us. Yes, flavor aid, whatever. <laughs> it's just flavor aid. But that's the joke doesn't work if you say flavor aid. All right. So let's start with the musical aspect of it. I'm not gonna pretend to be musically inclined enough to tell you the key signature here. So, Anna, you tell me. So, this song is four fucking chords. Very simple. The verse is in G flat. The chorus is in E flat. So, basically, it's a fiddle player's worst nightmare. They're like, don't fucking play music on this one, Anna. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 pretty simple chord progression, though. All right. So, uh, let's go ahead and fill in that staff. What, what can you tell us about the time signature? All right. So, we've got something besides 4-4. Four, four, four. Right. Something besides 4-4. Four, four. This is a first. Yeah. <laughs> like, we got a 6-8 time signature. That's great. But if you think that's going to bring anything new, fun to the mix, you are so wrong. Because they play it like a waltz. You cannot <laughs> clap along with this song without feeling like a passive-aggressive conductor. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> All right. So, 
for those of us not musically inclined enough to understand all of that, how would you describe the musicality like to a layman? Oh, okay. So it's like if Barney the Dinosaur tried to write a Nickelback song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm going to admit that like we were 15 seconds into this song and I was like, Okay, but it seems like music at least, though. And then these artful lyrics kicked in. <laughs> yeah, they did. Oh, yes, they did. So we're going to go through them, starting with the line, I would take no for an answer. Ooh, that makes him the first Christian musician to do that. So good start. Yeah, right. Start. <laughs> yeah, totally. And it goes on, just to know I heard you speak, which is some creepy stalker shit. So I, like, we'll eventually find out he's talking to God. But if you think of that as a lady, that's like, that's some jerking off to your dryer lint type shit, right? Yeah. Okay, judgy Noah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these Christian songs are like that, though. Yeah. He goes on, and I'm wondering why I never see the signs they claim they see. Oh, oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a whole lot of answering of your own questions in this song, right? definitely. Well, if you stand off to the side and just go atheism every eight fucking beats, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It might even fit the meter. That was the first parody. <laughs> Better than the fucking lyrics do anyway. <laughs> which, which brings us to this line. A lot of special revelations meant for everybody but me. Like, fuck the rhyme scheme. Every, everybody fits. He could have just gone with everyone, and then it just fits the goddamn meter. It's like he was paid per syllable. Right? Yeah. For these next few lines. It's wild. <laughs> oh, he, he goes on again, and he's like, maybe I don't truly know you, or maybe I just simply believe. He makes three. <laughs> it just, it's simply crammed in there like he was doing improv and realized that the last, oh, believe is not going to. But like, okay, this rhyme scheme is equivalent to like, you know, when kids will get to the end of the page too soon and they start writing downward along the margin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. That's the rhyme scheme for this song. Okay. Baby's first <laughs> birthday card, the lyrics. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, that, and that brings us to this amazing chorus. He goes, because I can sniff, I can see, and I can count up pretty high. Oh, pretty okay, high. It feels like a weird thing for a grown man to brag about. <laughs> Throw out there. Yeah, I get what he's trying. That he's trying to bring back like the smell, sight, smell the color nine. You know, smell yeah, the, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. but like for the title or whatever. But it makes him sound like a dingbat. Right, sure does. Sure right, does. he but he basically goes like, I know my colors and my animal sounds. Yeah, and that's literally. <laughs> That's literally why I, when I first parried this song, it was, I know A is for apple and B is for boat. Like, <laughs> and I just fill it with that. And Eli said it was too informational for this podcast. Okay, no, so that's fair. That. That's right. This is a fucking citation <laughs> yeah. needed here, okay? <laughs> so, no, the chorus goes out. He goes, you can count up pretty high, but these faculties aren't getting me any closer to the sky. Mm. But my heart of faith keeps pounding, so I know I'm doing fine. Actually, I would really like to know what he means by this, because none of the information so far points to doing fine. Yeah, no, yeah. he's a grown adult <laughs> bragging about how high he can count. Yeah, I don't mm -hmm. <laughs> And that he can smell shit. I suppose in the time of COVID, that is something to brag about. Okay, but. yeah. No, right, right. <laughs> sure. But then he, he wraps it up with, but sometimes finding you, that's God, it's just like trying to smell the color nine. All right. Now, side note, if you're looking at these lyrics on Genius.com, oh an anonymous commenter has said, quote, Chris is frustrated that his senses and mind won't stretch into the right shape to bring him close to Jesus. The use of synesthesia as an analogy suggests to me a solution to the problem. Maybe it's not what was consciously intended, but I think Chris has a hole in his heart shaped like one of these. And then there's... The picture of shrooms. <laughs> what? Yeah. And and then they conclude shamanism isn't conventionally Christian. I know. But maybe it's crazy enough to work. <laughs> and <it's no. laughs> what? <laughs> High on shrooms. Ex-Mormon was sitting there looking over the lyrics to smell the color nine. And was like... I got a way in here. Chris. You know what? Help with some psychedelics for this mother. But Chris needs my help. Right. No. Okay. That's fucking amazing. But I don't want to <laughs> gloss over the fact that the chorus for this Christian song is, wow, God sure is indistinguishable from the non-existence. Yeah. <laughs> 
Finding yeah. you is nonsense. Yes. yes. Yep. <laughs> yep. Pretty much. So if you look this song up on YouTube, you won't find a music video for it. You will, however, find a million fucking slideshows and covers of this song because Christians fucking love it. It is literally a song about how dumb it sounds to believe in God. Yeah. Yep. They fucking eat that shit up. <laughs> it's wild. Oh, why don't we just turn to the dark side, guys? Okay, so <laughs> second verse. Now, I've never felt the presence, but I know you're always near. Okay, why, though, if right? you've never felt the presence? Yeah. <laughs> I've never tried walking around this wall, but I'm pretty sure if I smash my head into it one more time, I'm going to break through with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he goes on, and I've never heard the calling, but somehow you've led me right here. <laughs> So, which is like, okay, I have no evidence and it doesn't make any sense, but what are the odds, guys, that we would be headlining at this wing hut if it hadn't been for divine <laughs> intervention? Yes, I know. Wing stop is just pizza hut, but still, right? Yes. I'm, I'm nailing it, everybody. <laughs> so I'm not looking for burning bushes or some divine graffiti to appear. Okay. Do Christians think graffiti just appears? magically oh no like there's graffiti <laughs> in the women's bathroom stall of the Times square toys r us that showed a guy playing his dick like a guitar i'm wondering if i should have followed the sign <laughs> <laughs> i mean you did end up marrying me so i did it's true yeah. maybe i was following yeah right right <laughs> exactly knows? that that was the sign so but i just i love that he ran out of miracle examples after one Right, he came yeah. up with burning bushes, and he's just like, "Fuck, divine!" Duh. Like he didn't even need it to rhyme; it just had to end it up here. Yeah, he goes, I, "I'm just begging you for your wisdom, and I believe you're putting some here." Then why are you begging for it? <laughs> <laughs> and then we repeat the chorus, and then the song like "Oz and Do's" for a bit. Yeah, it's like there was supposed to be a bridge, but he didn't feel like coming up with more lyrics. Exactly. Well, yeah. And then while you're listening to this, they decide to see if they can give a person motion sickness with stereophonics. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And there's also this undercurrent of these like little 90s, the wiki wiki DJ sounds. Yes. Just, <laughs> it just screams, see, we know what the kids are into these days. We know. <laughs> <laughs> this song is nothing right this guy was just like oh <laughs> smell the color nine sounds fucking deep bro and then like padded it with bullshit there's like there are 13 lines of opportunity to say anything at all before smell the color nine and they chose not to yeah it's finished at the you do not have to listen to this song it is finished at the title no you are a songwriter too does this song go fucking anywhere so okay it's like it's like the song that you'll start singing like you'll just start singing out the actions that you're doing to keep your pets calm when you're about to leave the door or whatever <laughs> oh it's God. it's like that and a chorus yeah. yeah and then as if it's not stupid enough he cuts in after the that chorus to go nine's not a color and even if it was you can't smell a color no that's my point exactly <laughs> Always good to clarify this kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know it's a clever turn of phrase if you have to spell it out for everybody. Right, yeah, exactly. This song is pretty sure we're arguing with it, I yeah. believe. Let go of my arm. <laughs> and, and, and then it just do 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 its way into a fade out. Yeah, they could have ended it really well at that's my point exactly. And even the beat pauses for it to like mm -hmm. but then they come right back into this instrumental I guess just so they can fade it out I do, it has a very like oh are we still going we're not going we're, are we going you're still going I'm I feel stupid not <laughs> yeah, going if you're going it's a very first time doing hey Jude at karaoke ending <laughs> hey, are you fucking with me there can't be that many we're still going the still <laughs> it's so true all right well, to prove that we're not just about knocking shit down, I also want to say something nice about the song before we wrap it up. And since that would require lying, Anna was kind <laughs> enough to write one of them parodies she was talking about. So now we can at least say that this piece of musical feces inspired something as awesome as this. Hit it, Anna. I 
but straight up teach you science if I knew you'd actually hear. But it seems like all the silence makes you think someday you'll appear. Any proof of evolution only seems to piss you off. You resort to seeing signs of God in your mom's beef stroganoff. You can search through the ocean, the sky, or the dirt. If you can find any evidence, then I'll eat my fucking shirt. When you're looking for nature to find the divine, it's not magic, it's a tragic fucking waste of time. It's mysterious ways I wish you would put down the Bible And listen to the experts instead Cause you're acting like a stubborn toddler Walking around with a bucket on your head You can search through the ocean, the sky and the dirt If you can find any evidence Then I'll leave a fucking shirt Thinking every coincidence must be a sign It's not magic, it's a tragic Fucking waste of time Like, literally, your point is Look how good God is at pretending he doesn't exist And hiding the fact that he exists Like, if you want people to believe in you Why would you hide the fact that you exist? That's so fucking dumb You can search through the ocean, the sky, and the dirt If you can find any evidence, then I'll eat my fucking shirt Because searching for Jesus is truly asinine It's not magic, it's just tragic Search through the ocean, the sky, or the dirt If you can find any evidence, then I'll eat my fucking shirt There's no literal way to turn water into wine Are you fucking high? You'll get a DUI What you're going through, what you're trying to do It's a fucking waste of time It's a waste of time If you change the definition of God Until it means something amorphous like love Or a black hole You're literally admitting that there's no evidence For intelligent design That's fucking stupid Thank you, Anna. An amazing job once again, as always. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Moves Day being at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday and an even newer episode of our half sister show citation needed day being at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this episode would barely qualify as a sub soda if I neglected to thank Keith Enright for all the writing, Eli Bosnick for all the snickering lucid illusions, for all the illusioning i don't know in fact i thought it was going to work it didn't work i need to also thank anna bosnick one more time and remind you to check the show notes if you want a link to buy her album i also want to thank nikki for providing this week's farnsworth quote and the important public service announcement that went with it but most of all of course i want to thank this week and last week's best people snack mark Heine burst charles david chairman mousy tongue eric raleigh support your local library mike person number 42 house alexander fiona steven and action lion with a commercial driver's license robin david and patricia who are also smart agent 86 got them Together, these 17 savory secular summon sufficient spirit to subsidize our sacrilegious screeds this week by giving us money. 
Not everybody has the money it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, you don't have enough dough to spell out donation, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIATPod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the offices of P. Andrew Torres, Tim Robinson, and handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. <laughs> no, no, thank you. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.